lecture today. Uh, we will have uh, Dr. Mazen Sinjab, he will give his talk, then we'll have Dr. Uh, Sharif and Dr. Yeah, Dr. Yahya, then Dr. Sharif, they will give a talk about the first episode of Cataract series uh, sessions, and this is the first. And I'm also honored to have Dr. Brian Kim and Dr. Razena from United States to be with us as panelists. Thank you for all of you. Uh, and I hope that you will enjoy today the discussions. And if there is anyone want just to share with us his opinion or to discuss or to ask a question, just he can either to send a question or to raise the hand and we can just give him the mic to talk with us and discuss lively. Uh, we are going to have a, a series of uh, actually a cataract uh, series about eight episodes. So it will be not every week. So we will have one time cataract anterior as an anterior segment. Then we'll have another week or uh, it will be a posterior segment. Then we go I'm going back to <coughs> anterior segment like that till we finish that one. And also in the posterior segment from the next week, we will have also like a series in a different um, topics in retina and other uh, subspecialties in posterior segment. Uh, I think we are going to have uh, the first talk and it will be uh, by Dr. Mazen Sinjab, my dear friend, Dr. Mazen. He will give a talk about exceeding expectation for dry eye patient. Dr. Mazen, please. Bismillah, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Mohammed, for the invitation. And I'd like to thank Alergan for inviting me uh, to talk about this. And uh, uh, this is my financial disclosure. I'm receiving an honorarium from Alergan for the second part of this presentation. Now, the first part of the presentation is purely scientific. I'm going to talk about the pillars of healthy ocular surface. Um, which consists of uh, the balanced nervous system, functional corneal nerves, balanced hormones, normal lacrimal gland, normal vascul vasculator, vasculature kinetics, normal eyelids and blink rates, pivotal meibomian glands, um, norm and normal uh, conjunctival uh, uh, goblet <laughs> cell. Okay, now, we all know that there is something called the ocular surface disease, but the ocular surface disease has plenty of manifestations. Part of it is dry eye. Not, um, um, uh, we cannot say that ocular surface disease means dry eye. It is just part of it. Other manifestations include meibomian gland dysfunction, which is usually associated with dry eye disease. There is also meibomitis related keratoconjunctivitis, neurotrophic keratopathy, anterior blepharitis allergic conjunctivitis, corneal epithelial basement membrane dystrophy, uh, conjunctival calasis, um, uh, keratoneuralgia, computer vision syndrome, pterygium, and re recurrent corneal erosion syndrome. Um, in this lecture, I'm going to highlight um, very important tips which are important for general ophthalmologists um, regarding the uh, first four uh, diseases. Now, um, regarding the dry eye disease and meibomian gland dysfunction together, I'm going to talk uh, it, because they are usually associated. According to tfos Dues 2 report, the uh, definition of the dry eye disease is a multifactorial disease of ocular surface, um, which is characterized by loss of homeostasis of uh, tear film, uh, which leads to tear film instability and hyperosmolarity, causing inflammation and damage to the ocular surface. In addition, it is associated with a neurosensory abnormalities. Now, um, the uh, classification of the dry eye disease according to, to the tfos Dues 2 is evaporative dry eye and uh, the uh, accuracy, uh, aqueous deficiency dry eye, but actually, uh, there is no pure one of them. They are mixed, uh, more or less one of them. Uh, however, the most important components of the, uh, uh, let's say the, this vicious circle of the dry eye disease are the uh, lacrimal secretions, usually we find low secretions, meibomian gland dysfunction, and the, uh, a compromise of the goblet cell uh, in ocular surface. Uh, this is the cascade, inflammatory cascade, that we uh, see it in the ocular surface disease in general, um, which starts with, usually starts with hyperosmolarity, especially if it is dry eye disease, then tear film instability causing cell stress, and uh, after that cell death, 
then the inflammatory process will be initiated in, um, uh, let's say, two modes, the innate immunity, cytokines, uh, chemokines, uh, MMP, um, MMPs, and the uh, adaptive immunity uh, where uh, or in which the lymph nodes are involved. Um, causing inflammation and again and again the vicious circle. But the inflammation will cause epithelial disease, corneal barrier disruption, neural sensitization, and loss of goblet cells. Uh, great. Now, the, there are um, uh, risk factors of the dry eye disease. Some of them are consistent. Some of them are, um, let's say, uh, uh, not consistent. Uh, like the consistent ones are age, gender, bibomian gland dysfunction, connective tissue diseases, Jogren syndrome, uh, androgen deficiency, screen use, uh, contact lens wear, oestrogen ost replacement therapy, because um, let's say that androgen, when it goes down, then there will be dry eye. Oestrogen, when it goes up, there will be uh, a dry eye. Um, hematopoietic stem cell uh, transplantation, certain environmental conditions and medications. I want to highlight the Jogren syndrome. We have to ask the patient about uh, the uh, symptoms um, and to look for the signs of Jogren, Jogren, Jogren syndrome in every patient suffering from chronic dry eye. Because uh, uh, let's say 10% of the patients uh, they have uh, underlying Jogren syndrome. And in a meta-analysis of uh, this disease, uh, it has been found that uh, almost 20% of uh, people having primary Jogren syndrome are associated with malignancies. Um, so it's very important to diagnose this disease very early and uh, by referring the patient. So uh, what I'm usually doing when I find a patient um, with very chronic dry eye disease. And uh, even if I have a doubt of Jogren syndrome, I refer him to a rheumatologist in order to figure it out. Uh, the um, other uh, one I would like to highlight is the screen use. Nowadays, we are online school, we are online work. Um, so it has a very big role. Uh, the other uh, factor is the contact lens. We are, of course, we have to ask the patient especially females, whether they are wearing contact lenses, especially cosmetics. Now, uh, the other thing is the certain environmental conditions, especially if the patient is exposed to high-speed airflow um, during sleep or in the office, uh, or even driving the car, the air conditioner is usually uh, directed towards um, the, the face, high exposure to ultraviolet, air pollution, high heat index, and uh, proximity to salt water. Um, the, the nature of the water that uh, we are taking a shower for, with it, for example, uh, affects the dry eye disease. Um, now, the probable risk factors include the diabetes, rosacea, uh, viral infection, thyroid disease, uh, psychiatric conditions, teresium, low fatty acid intake, refractive surgery, allergic conjunctivitis, and medications. Medications responsible for the dry eye disease are anticholinergic, diuretics, beta blockers, antihistamines, and anti-glaucoma. So it's very important to prescribe lubricants to people having uh, anti-glaucoma medications because this is a chronic use of anti-glaucoma medications causing uh, a dry eye disease and causing incompliance to uh, the uh, 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 anti-glaucoma uh, uh, drops. Now, uh, the inconclusive risk factors, uh, some ethnicities, uh, menopause, acne, sarcoidosis, smoking, alcohol, pregnancy, demodex infestation, botulinum toxin injection sometimes, multivitamins, oral contraceptives. Uh, we know that the impact of the dry eye disease is uh, it affects the topography, it induces high order abrasions, it affects visual acuity and refraction, changes the K readings, it changes corneal uh, thickness, um, and all of this will lead to inaccurate biometry before cataract surgery, and it will cause dissatisfaction after premium IOL implantation and dissatisfaction after laser-based refractive surgery, because we know that the tear film instability will lead to irregularities on corneal surface, and in addition to uh, sometimes hypertrophy of the epithelium uh, or sometimes thinning of the epithelium and sometimes irregularity of the epithelium, um, high order abrasions, as you see here, um, uh, instability of vision, blurring of vision. Um, uh, in addition that the uh, inaccurate K readings 
uh, and therefore the inaccurate, uh, let's say, the uh, uh, biometry. So it's very important words to give the patient before doing the biometry, every patient to give a lubricant for at least one week, even if the patient is not suffering from uh, the uh, dry eye disease, because uh, almost 80% of patients coming for cataract surgery, they have asymptomatic, non-symptomatic uh, uh, dry eye disease. Um, now, regarding the diagnosis of the dry eye disease, the best uh, test is to go for the osmolarity because it is the more, most accurate one um, in comparison with the other uh, uh, diagnostic tests. Uh, and according to the TFOS used to, the uh, diagnosis should be put by having symptoms in addition one of the following markers. So if there, is, uh, there are no symptoms, it is not a dry eye disease. It may be other, uh, let's say, uh, ocular surface diseases. So there must be symptoms in addition to one of the following markers. The non-invasive um, and breakup time, uh, uh, the uh, abnormal os osmolarity or ocular surface staining. Now, uh, we come to the osmolarity. These are the cutoff values for the, um, the, uh, the osmolarity um, above which, uh, let's say that uh, the patient have, uh, has a dry eye disease. Uh, this is corneal staining and ocular surface staining and lid, lid staining. We have to put this in mind. Um, it is defined as having more than five corneal spots or more than nine conjunctival spots or uh, the lid margin has more than two millimeter length. I'm sorry for the voices coming from here and there. Okay. And um, okay. Uh, we come to the uh, severity of inflammation. Every case of dry eye disease is associated with, the, um, with inflammation. Uh, according to the definition by the TFOS DUS2. So this test does not diagnose dry eye disease. It just tests the uh, severity of inflammation associated with dry eye disease. Um, you all know the cutoff values. I'm not going to, uh, to, to talk about this, but the very important neighbor, neighbor that we have to take care of is the uh, meibomian glands. Uh, and uh, we know that there is a disease called mebomitis related keratoconjunctivitis affecting the cornea. And um, uh, 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 let's say that the, the location of the uh, problem on the cornea corresponds to those uh, inflamed mebomian glands, as we see here in this uh, picture. Okay, uh, the wider the uh, inflammation in the glands, the wider the uh, problem on the corneal surface. Uh, actually, it is, um, let's say it is classified into flectinular and non-flectinular. Uh, sometimes it's uh, severe enough to cause corneal perforation. Um, and sometimes it's mild enough to be skipped when we uh, check by the sleet lamp. Uh, and sometimes we may think this um, like sequelae of um, herpes disease. So not every uh, opacity with vascularization in the cornea are related to herpes. Sometimes they are related to mebomitis related keratoconjunctivitis. Okay, so um, this is the uh, non, this is the flectinular type where we find um, a flectin on the cornea itself. And this is the non flectinular type where we find just opacity, or sometimes we find generalized diseased epithelium. Um, now, according to this study, which is the most um, famous one in this regard, um, two groups were, were compared, uh, normal and diseased group. Uh, the uh, P acnes were isolated in almost quarter of the normal people as flora, uh, while um, the, the P acnes consists 60% uh, of the, um, the pathogen, pathogens isolated in the diseased group. So we have to put in mind this pathogen in order to treat it. The neurotrophic keratopathy, uh, in many cases, it is associated with the dry eye and it is defined as decrease or absence of corneal sensation, which lead to, um, of course, it can be classified into normal, mild, moderate and uh, uh, severe, and it will affect for sure the, uh, the epithelium and the stroma. So it is classified into mild when the epithelial changes are without epithelial defect, 
moderate when the epithelial defect, there is with, uh, epithelial defect without stromal defect and severe when there is stromal involvement. And all of this is related to the severity of the loss of uh, the uh, branching and number of the uh, uh, nerve fibers. Uh, the clinical presentations of this uh, keratopathy, when it is um, mild, um, it will cause only dryness and photophobia, uh, inability to read for a prolonged period of time. Look at this symptom, it is very important. Many patients come and they say, whenever we read more than half an hour, we, we lose vision, we cannot uh, continue. So most probably it is because of the neuropathy, uh, impaired quality of vision, uh, reduced blink rate, in the moderate and severe, uh, there is um, the, the pain and discomfort as uh, are less or absent due to hypostasia or anesthesia. Now we come to the peers of in the management of the ocular surface disease. You have to listen to the patient. You have to spend time with the patient listening to the uh, symptoms. In addition, you have to look at the eyes of the patient while they are talking because you may figure out some symptoms and some signs like loss of or a low blinking rate, for example. Uh, we have to check the corneal sensation in every patient who is suffering from dry eye disease. And we have to test the four quadrants. In addition, we have to test the conjunctival sensation. It's not only the corneal sensation. Um, corneal staining is mandatory for all cases. And if it is superior in the, uh, in the cornea, uh, we have to be suspicious um, because it might, it might be because of flappy eyelid changes on the palpebral conjunctiva, superior limbic keratoconjunctivitis, or contact lens induced limbal stem cell deficiency, such as in this case, which is caused by the contact lens. Uh, of course, we have to emphasize and provide clear instructions on lid hygiene. And whenever we see this, we have to, to uh, have a doubt about the demodex. Uh, we have to use anti-inflammatory therapy as early as possible only when indicated. It should not be as a habit. It should be only when indicated. Uh, of course, the anti-inflammatory therapy consists of, uh, let's say, a wide range of products. The cyclosporine, uh, which inhibits T-cell activation and reduces inflammatory cytokines, it increases tear production, goblet cell density, and corneal sensation. The lifity grass, which is a, a LFA1 antagonist, it increases as well tear production, goblet cell density, and corneal sensation. Uh, topical steroids, which suppresses inflammation broadly, but the limitation is IOP, elevation, cataract, and infection. Therefore, topical steroids can be given just for a very short term in the beginning of the treatment. Uh, of course, um, tetracycline and metalloproteinase uh, inhibitors, uh, they have a role, tacrolimus have, has a role. Uh, systemic antibiotics and macroleads uh, have, have a role as well. We have to minimize preservative toxicity. Um, we have to manage patient expectations and be persistent. And we, we should give them self-support uh, by reassuring them that they will improve. Uh, I, I always advise to use a questionnaire in order to test the um, uh, like the improvement of the symptoms. Uh, there are two types of the questionnaires. and. Um, we have to remember the neighborhood. It's very important when patient is suffering from dry eye disease, we have to check the neobombing gland dysfunction, especially when we, have some, when we see some lesions on the cornea. Now, this is part two, which is related to allergan, um, uh, including the restasis. Uh, of course, we said that the restasis is an anti-inflammatory product, and uh, actually it uh, affects and cuts the, uh, the uh, cascade of inflammation, um, uh, it also increases the tear film production as per studies. Um, uh, it increases, or let's say, let's say improves the tear film breakup time uh, over time. And it, um, it changes the corneal sensation, uh, staining, sorry. It changes corneal staining. It reduces corneal staining, which means vital, more vital epithelium. Uh, and it increases the goblet cell. Uh, density. Um, I would like to present these two cases, which I presented before, but um, because um, Allergan asked me to, to present them, uh, I'm presenting uh, the uh, first one, 48-year-old uh, female um, suffering from chronic dryness, redness on and off, irritation, blurring of vision on and off. Uh, vision is 20-20 with hair glasses and no systemic diseases. 
Um, I did the investigations that everyone um, does in the clinic, like coronal staining, tear fan breakup time, Schermel test, uh, OSDI, and the MMP9. Uh, there was no corneal staining, but the uh, tear film quality was very, very bad, as you see here. From um, just after blinking, you see this uh, uh, this picture, and uh, this is the tear film breakup time, then the non-invasive. Schirmer test shows showed uh, seven millimeter in the right eye, eight millimeter in the left eye, and this is the questionnaire which gave a score uh, of moderate to severe. Okay, moderate to severe dry eye according to this questionnaire. Now I put the patient uh, on restasis for six months, and then I uh, tested again the same investigations. Um, the tear film breakup time uh, very much improved. Um, Schirmer almost same as before the treatment, and the questionnaire showed a very uh, imp good improvement in the severity of the, uh, the dry eye disease. So it was moderate to severe, but after treatment, it became mild, according to the questionnaire. Uh, this is another case, which is a 32-year-old male um, suffering from chronic dryness, redness in most of the time, fluctuating 2020 unaided, and no systemic diseases. Um, the same investigations, corneal staining, tear film breakup time, Schirmer test, uh, the questionnaire, and the uh, test for the severity of the inflammation, uh, this was the corneal staining, generalized uh, punctate epithelial erosions, which means diseased uh, epithelium. Uh, of course, this is one of the criteria. The, um, we said that more than five uh, dots uh, are, uh, to include the patient. Uh, Schirmer test was very low, five millimeter in the right eye, four millimeter in the left eye. And the questionnaire showed um, almost severe dry eye disease, okay? Almost severe dry eye disease. I put the patient on restasis for six months and then I checked the, sensei, the, the staining of the cornea. This is before and this is after. Very much improvement in the staining, although the Schirmer test uh, stayed uh, as before. So restasis improves the quality of uh, the tear film, uh, even if the quantity of the tear film maybe uh, does not change. And this is the questionnaire of the, uh, this patient. This is before and this is after. So the patient moved from the almost severe to uh, mild to moderate uh, of uh, uh, dry eye disease uh, symptoms. And thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Mazen. Very interesting and, as usual, a good presentation. Um, there is so many questions. In my mind, all the times, you know, ocular surface disease, we are facing all the time. We are talking about dry eye all the time, all the time, but even still, the dry eye is one of the most, our ocular surface disease is one of the most important diseases that we are facing in anterior segment. Uh, and it is only a, not a dry eye, you know, it, when dry eye is one of the ocular surface disease. Uh, there is one question it came to my mind when you are presenting Dr. Nazin, how the dry eye affecting the corneal thickness. You said it, there is an effect on the corneal thickness. It came to my mind how I just yeah, know if you have question. an idea or... <clears throat> very good question. Actually, uh, corneal thickness is affected by the outlayers, uh, which are the epithelium and the endothelium. Of course, the endothelium more, more effect. The epithelium, whenever it is diseased, it cannot protect the, the uh, uh, corneal thickness. And it has been shown by some studies that the diseased cornea, the diseased corneal epithelium uh, causes some hydration, hydration of the corneal thick of the cornea, causing, of course, increase of uh, corneal thickness. Uh, moreover, the epithelium itself, um, the thickness of the epithelium will be affected by the dry eye disease, chronic dry eye disease. It may go, first of all, it goes into hypertrophy, then it goes into irregularity, then it goes into atrophy or uh, uh, let's say a thin, very thin layer of the epithelium. So in these two mechanisms, uh, it is affected. Okay. Thank Can you I ask much. a question, Dr. Mezen? Yeah. Yeah, yes, Pablo Victoria. Yeah. <clears throat> Dr. Mezen, thank you very much for excellent simplified uh, presentation, but <clears throat> I want to correlate this with the cataract and one of the most common correlations is my bobbing gland dysfunction that we see 
it, ex it ex uh, increases after the cataract surgery due to the drops due to the surgery. And this really annoys the patient. So what are your advices? Pre-operative, in cases that they are borderline, my bone gland dysfunction, and what would you do after they elaborate and uh, become uh, really annoying to the patient? Very good, thank you very much. Uh, actually, um, as I mentioned in one of the slides that um, uh, dry eye disease is a risk factor for inaccurate measurements of the IOL, and it is uh, a major factor of dissatisfaction after premium IOL uh, implantation in cataract surgery. So uh, this is why uh, it is recommended to give lubricant to, pay to the patient before doing the, uh, the biometry. Now, uh, in addition, uh, we have to take the keratins. For example, the patient came and we gave lubricant and we asked the patient, please come after one week. And they came after one week. Now we do the K reading measurements by the autoref, for example, and IOL master or autoref and topography or topography and IOL master. So two machines, if we find difference in K readings and amount of astigmatism, it means there is an ocular surface disease. So we have to uh, test again and we have to extend the period of the lubrication and the treatment of the ocular surface disease, whatever the, back, the, the background is. And then we, we check the patient again and again. So this is mandatory to treat ocular surface before doing the cataract surgery. Now, uh, after the cataract surgery, yes, um, any incision, any operation in the ocular surface, um, cataract surgery is through the ocular surface. So in this case, uh, usually the nervous system and the ocular surface will be somehow uh, upset uh, because of the trauma and it causes an increase of the dry eye uh, uh, that the patient had before. So uh, uh, of course we have to treat as well. Uh, we have to, um, uh, to take care of this. So, so this is my answer. But uh, when the patient present post-operative with yeah. severe irritation and the full blown, yeah. is it only lubricants or would you give more uh, uh, very good. Drops, uh, uh, anti-inflammatory, systemic tetracycline or? Yeah, very good question. Uh, now, let me show you these three slides, only three slides within one minute, to show you how treatment of dry eye disease should be staged in stages. Uh, it should be not all together to, to give everything together. So if you allow me just to share this one very quickly. Okay, now you can see the screen, right? Yeah. Yes, Dr. Safwan. Okay, uh, uh, Dr. Mazin, I, I would like Dr. to be Mazin, like Dr. Sorry. Safwan, but um, unfortunately I cannot, <laughs> he's better you than are me. Both, you are both my friend, no problem. <laughs> okay, now step one, education. Treat underlying pathology. Environmental modification. Modification of topical and systemic medications. Lubricants lead hygiene and warm, co warm compressors. This is stage number one. So lubricants is a part of, but discussing all other factors with the patient is mandatory. Okay, this is step one. Step two is step one plus the followings. We have to put Demodex uh, into uh, consideration. Nibomian gland treatment. So we don't send the patient to the uh, thermal therapy or blah, blah, blah from the first step. We have to modify everything related to the environment. We have to give lubricant. Uh, we have to uh, treat the background. And then if no, no improvement, we can go to the step two, which includes the, the bombing gland treatment, topical anti-inflammatory medications, the steroids, cyclosporines, lifetigrast, and topical antibiotics like the azithromycin. Now, if this doesn't work, then we go to step three, which includes step one and two, in addition to punctal plugs. Punctal plugs comes in step three, not in step one. We must not put punctal plugs in every patient coming because of dry eye. We have to go st through step one, then step two. Then if it is not useful, we can go for punctal plugs <clears throat> or sometimes autologous uh, serum, bandage contact lenses, oral anti-inflammatory medications, 
uh, like Dr. Yahya, what you asked about the tetracycline, erythromycin, azithromycin with low doses uh, of these antibiotics. So this is my answer. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mazen. Thank you. We have three questions. If you allow me, please, because we don't want to miss the time, then I will come back to you, Dr. Safan. Uh, there is a question from Dr. Ahmad Ali. During menopause, this for you, Dr. Mazen. You are not so fun. So estrogen level is uh, falling down. Could that be the cause of the dry eye? I didn't uh, understand yeah. it much, but I, if you understand, yeah. can you give us? Yeah, very good. Actually, this is controversial. Now, some studies showed that estrogen, high level of estrogen increases dry eye. Some studies showed no, low level of estrogen increases dry eye. So this is controversial. Let, let me say that any imbalance, imbalance in the hormones will cause dry eye, regardless which is going up or which is going down. Okay. Uh, second question from my dear friend, Dr. Qasim Hamouri. He's having two questions. Do you have a cause allergic to restasis? Uh, uh, sorry, do you have cases allergic to restasis? Sorry. No, till now not. Um, okay, I think there is a, is it recommended to give restasis continuously for six months as I mentioned? Yeah, it is. This is the course uh, of restasis. Yeah. Okay. Uh, then uh, I have one question, Dr. Mazen, uh, and uh, this one can be for uh, everyone here in the panel. Um, uh, regarding using uh, uh, restasis, uh, uh, the age of the patient that we can use. So is it possible to use in children? And what is the age that we can use? Is there any different precautions we have to take care in while you are using that or not? Because you know, dry eye now, it's also, it's happened in uh, uh, children. They are using uh, laptops, they are using mobile. So they are, we are seeing a patient, they are having a dry eye. Well, um, I'm not aware of studies of restasis on children. I'm not aware of, maybe there is, but I don't know. But however, uh, I don't think that um, dry eye is severe enough in children to develop meibomian gland dysfunction and all the manifestations that we see in adults. I don't think that, I, I have never seen a child like this. Yes, dry eye uh, because of screens, uh, because of low blink blinking rate, uh, but not to the severity that restasis is recommended. This is my opinion. Uh, so, no, I don't mean it's only children. I mean, it can be also 15 years, 17 years, this one. What is the age now, if you want to give? When we can start using cyclosporine and treat it as an adult, let's say in this other way. Uh, personally, I, I don't, I'm not aware if there is a cut of age, but usually it is in adults, which means above 18, but I don't know whether it is given to below 18. Uh, maybe okay, Dr. Azena, if you have in, uh, or I have, Dr. Brian, yes, yeah, I, I, I have, so again, I agree. I don't think there's really much studies to say um, when is the cutoff, but I've used Restasis, I've used Cyclosporin, I've used top, these are all topically, I've used topical tacrolimus in kids. Um, so here in Texas, we do see pretty severe keratoconjunctivitis conjunctivitis from mybomian gland disease in our uh, Latin Hispanic population to the point of, you know, even corneal perforation in these, um, you know, nine, 10, 11 year olds. Um, and then, so I always want to try um, some, some steroid sparing agent because you can't keep just putting them on uh, topical steroids, of course, with the development of cataract elevator pressure. Um, the other young patient population I've used um, cyclosporin in is um, uh, tigacins um, as a steroid sparing agent. Um, and there's, you know, some studies in adults on that, but I've had a few patients um, that I've uh, ended up being able to get off of steroids um, and putting them on uh, topical restasis. So I'm pretty comfortable with, uh, you know, I would say I've treated eight, nine, eight, nine years and above. Mm -hmm. Problem, Zaina, it's that the, 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 the ability of the continue, continue, continuing the treatment for those ages, those ages that are not willing to continue using the treatment and the uh, Restasis, we need it three times for six months. So I don't think so that they, they can willing to, 
to continue six months for on this street. <clears throat> it's definitely a the compliance is definitely an issue, but luckily yeah. we have a lot of patients, uh, parents that help. Uh, yeah, definitely yeah. the kids aren't going to use them themselves for sure. Yeah. Is there any comment from uh, Dr. Brian or any Dr. Sharif, Dr. Yahya about what we are here? We are having another comment from, yes, Dr. Brian. I was just going to reiterate to what Zaina said. I mean, we, we have a pretty robust Hispanic population in Northwest Georgia as well. And I do see those patients with mybomitis and, uh, you know, they tend to develop chalasia as well and have this significant keratitis keratitis with corneal vascularization and so forth. So I do echo that. But with regard to the, you know, like the other issues mentioned about, you know, prolonged use of screen time and stuff. For me as a parent, I would say reduce screen time is probably my first recommendation. <laughs> yeah. You know, now there is a, a, a school a teaching only from the far, you know, it's from home. Uh, they are mandatory to use this one, you know, it's not the, because of Corona these times, they are not going to the school. So they are just studying from home. It's what we yeah. are facing. Uh, we is there any comment? Just yes, one no, comment on that. We actually just um, submitted to Survey of Ophthalmology a review of kind of this whole concept of computer vision syndrome, um, you know, increase in obviously with COVID, the all the um, screen use. Um, and, I, and I think Dr. Mazin uh, Sinjab mentioned this, but uh, we, we're finding that it really has to do with the changes in blink rate. Um, yes. That is really what's affecting the younger population, because I agree, it's not necessarily decrease in, um, you know, lacrimal gland production of tearing. It's more um, evaporative, decreased blink rate, all of these things. And I agree with Brian, Kim, um, in terms of decreasing as much, but it's not realistic anymore. So I do think we should treat them. Um, we should, you know, there's these 2020 rule where you take a break from the computer and, you know, there's a lot of behavioral changes that can be done, but um, it's, it's definitely an issue now that we're seeing more often. Zainab, okay, so for, for just, for, yeah, Dr. Mohammed, just two okay. comments for, for you. For your, uh, for your, that's that behavioral changes. What I'm doing for my patient is that I'm I'm putting a stick on if they are using the laptop or or a desktop, a stick on it saying blink. So whenever they are seeing that stick, they will blink and prevent them from using the phone after the blink after the uh, laptop or or desktop when they have any free time from uh, in between the lectures. So uh, apart from this, we, uh, I just need to return back to comment on Dr. Yahya, uh, what he said related to post-op uh, treatment. I do agree fully that we are facing, most of us uh, facing this problem after the cataract surgery. And uh, the important issues is that behavior of the, patient, of the patient when they are sleeping. When we are reaching in our treatment to the antibiotic like azithromycin or tetracycline, and we are seeing that their condition will be improved for a while of time, one week or 10 days. And once we reduce the antibiotic, their condition will return back to the uh, mybomiitis. So my suggestion to them is to correct their sleeping way. That's a, a way in a way that the eye will not touch their arms or their clothes or the pillows, because once that eye will, will touch the, clo the clothes or the pillow, the, the mybomiitis, which uh, and, and, and the main important uh, uh, bacteria that isolated from the mybomiitis is that compilobacteria acne, the gram negative. That's the main issues that in creating this uh, uh, mybomiitis as an infection. So uh, uh, important things to uh, uh, treat the patient or teach him how to sleep and prevent touching the eyelids to the pillow or to the clothes. Thank you, Dr. Sapan. I have, I need only a very short uh, answer about the uh, and comment. This is another comment, I think, uh, rather than question from Dr. Qasim Al Hamouri. Uh, he said the recommendations three months, then you uh, you can uh, monitor after that that you can repeat the regimen for two months in maximum. Uh, I don't know if there is any comment about this one or not. It is mentioned that it can be recommended that drugs recommended for three months. I think that then, Dr. Mazin, he will answer. Uh, um, what Mazin. I know, what is recommended from the studies um, is six months. This is what I know, uh, not three months. Yeah, well, well, the, okay. the first recommendation okay. it was three months. That's okay, the, I have another. Okay, 
Okay, Doctor. Uh, can we? And uh, this is uh, another comment from Doctor Osama Ababna. Is our also dear friends from Jordan, uh, Professor Osama Ababna, uh, my friend. Uh, he said, "I prefer to keep restasis as the last line treatment for dryness and not as the first line. There are many drugs that can be used initially and in severe cases. Restasis will be your choice." Uh, is there any comment about this one, Doctor Mazi? Uh, I totally agree. We, we should not start the restasis or other anti-inflammatory from the beginning. This is why I uh, showed the three slides, the staged treatment of the dry eye disease. And of course, treatment of the underlying causes and the treating of the, the uh, let's say, uh, other things that may complicate the case. For example, the neurotrophic, the uh, uh, bimomitis related peritoconjunctivitis. So all of that should be treated together. Uh, not only just giving restasis from the beginning. Uh, I think there is many other comment and question, but uh, my dear friend, Dr. Uh, Brian, Dr. Brian and Dr. Zaina, they already answered them. Uh, so now we want to move to the next sessions and to the first episode of Cataract uh, that we are going to conduct it during or through our uh, coming webinars. Uh, and the first talk, it will be today by Dr. Yahya. And he is Dr. Yahya Salahuddin, and he is going to talk about different types of cataract that we are dealing with. So, Dr. Yahya, the mic with you. <clears throat> you are mute, Dr. Yahya. So, please, can you unmute yourself? So, the screen is shared. Thank you, Dr. Yeah. Muhammad. Thank you, everybody. Uh, it's uh, an, the first time to give this presentation. And this is an, actually an introduction to the whole episodes of cataract we're going to talk about in the coming uh, month. And uh, I asked myself, why? Why, if it is cataract, we all know the types of cataracts, but if you are a beginner, if you're starting, you really should know that there are so many different types of cataract. There are techniques, details that we should know. There are complications that we should anticipate in some cases. There are extra tools needed in difficult cases. Choice of IL can be a problem in other cataract cases, post-operative expectations. So there are a lot of things to, to know about types of cataract, which can be congenital, developmental, senile cataract, with all its type, we can deal with traumatic cataract, uveitic cataract, subluxated cataracts, and others, many others. Almost not all cataracts are the same. So if you're starting, usually as residents, we everybody would like, he says, I want to do cataract, I want to do FACO, but really you should consider many things. And one of the, uh, in senile cataract or pre senile cataract, the loca locus uh, classification is good to document. It's good for documentation and understanding and correlating the vision and the severity of the cataract that the patient have. And it's very useful if we are doing research. But we have to learn more about the clinical examination to detect if it's peripheral cataract, is it central cataract, is it posterior subcapsular, is it uh, affecting the, uh, the whole nucleus and it's nuclear, dense nuclear, mature cataract, intumescent cataract, everything we are going to, to, to talk about so I'm going to get through in a not very complicated way because we are going to tackle each of the topics separately later on in the episodes, not today. Today is like an introduction, but I just want to highlight for our younger colleagues how important their understanding of which cataract they are going to operate on. One of the main uh, cataracts that we can see are soft cataracts, whether it's in a young person or you're doing refractive lens exchange or even in older patients, many times we see softer cataracts. And one of the things that we used to say when we teach cataracts, we tell that we don't want uh, the beginners to use soft cataract. And the main thing you should understand why we were saying this and we can correct this actually, and we can start with it. There is no cracking. The soft nucleus, you cannot do the manipulations you're going to hear about, about nucleus management. Actually, 
the whole key of soft cataract is lot of hydro hydration, hydrosection, hydration of the nucleus, then it is a very simple uh, procedure. And actually it's very suitable for a beginner if you use the correct technique, because then you don't need to, to be so much mastering of the foot switch or the techniques of cracking and dealing of the nucleus. So as a start, the soft cataract, if we understand what makes it difficult and what makes it easy, then you can proceed. Let's move on and more immature cataracts, nuclear, uh, nuclear cataracts, grade two or three. These are ideal cataracts we used to tell our residents. These are the ideal cases that you can perform the different techniques of nucleus management or disassembling the nucleus. So if you are going to operate in such cases, you should really understand very well the machine setup. You, you should be very comfortable using the machine. Remember, as we are going to, to talk through this later on, that the FACO machine, you have to master it even after, before you start doing the surgery. It's like driving a car. You have to have your foot switch is the key of manipulating and maneuvering inside the eye. The foot switch is exactly like the gas pedal in the car and the brakes. You can maneuver with a car in a crowded city like Cairo, for example, if you, uh, if you are good enough to use the paddles and you know how to change speed and move smoothly uh, between the crowded cars. If you don't know, you are going to crash and have an accident. And this is exactly the same. Learn very well. If you are moving to this type of cataract, you will need to, to do uh, different types of nucleus management, whether divide and conquer, nucleus chopping horizontal or vertical, all this we are going to talk about in different episodes. But to do this, you have to master the foot switch. You have to correlate your hearing and seeing and feeling with <clears throat> the settings on your machine. So let's move to a more difficult case. Once you get comfortable in regular case like nuclear two, nuclear three, you master the technique, you're getting better, you're getting more ambitious and you want to do more difficult cases, you will see, and this in our part of the world, we see these types of cataract very often. So you, I'm going to tell you that there is a subset called intumescent cataract. The intumescent cataract is a sort of mature cataract, but the lens is swollen. The intumescent cataract can be white. And if it is white, usually the nucleus is not hard, but it can be brown as well. You have a, or a black, very dense nucleus. The key in intumescent cataract is to break what is, has changed in such cases. Again, these are just, I'm giving you highlights and we're going to elaborate on this later on in other episodes, but you always think when you move from one type to a, of cataract to another type, more difficult, you ask yourself, what is making this lens different? What is making it more difficult? Here in tumescent cataract is the contrast and the high pressure inside the capsular bag that will tend to uh, extend. And, and the, the main issue in intumescent cataract is doing a proper capsular access. <clears throat> so as a surgeon, you have to prepare Capsular stain should be available from the beginning of the surgery to avoid to do proper capsular access and with different techniques to be to avoid the extension of the capsular access, which is actually the major difficulty in just such cases. So what I want to tell you that you by by gradually you are building your knowledge, knowing which type of cataract you're going to deal, anticipating what you need in such cases and what the problem are going to be so as you can plan properly and you can do your surgery properly. So we move on into black cataracts and still we see these black cataracts. You have issues of the visibility of the capsule. You have, so you, you have to prepare capsular stain. You have an issue, this is what is different from nuclear two or three, which are you have now been trained to do perfectly well. What is different? This is the question always ask yourself. You want 
in any difficult case to analyze what is different to make a difficult case converted into a regular case using the same techniques after solving the problem. The problem with these types of black cataracts, the nucleus is very hard, the nucleus is very thick. So you would think that you will need to do to use a lot more power. If you use a lot of power, too much power, you're going to insult the cornea. The corneal endothelium will be affected. So you should think, number one, how to manage the power by using techniques that minimizes the use of power and making it efficient and cracking the nucleus in different techniques we are going to elaborate about to, as, to decrease the power, decreasing the incidence of uh, wound burns and essentially protecting the cornea endothelium. These cases might take long time, but if you do it properly, it will have minimal effect on the cornea endothelium. So in such cases, you will need capsular stain, you will prepare it, you will know that you are using the machine very comfortably, never go to such a case if you are not comfortable using the machine. Think of how to decrease the power. It's not only the measurement of the power, it is where you apply the power. And then you deal with the nucleus, protect the cornea, and use whatever special techniques you will need to, to get you into a safe position in such cases. Let's move to another case that you might see. It's these cases, two categories, the posterior subcapsular cataract or posterior polar cataracts. And observe here, the, these cases, we see it a lot. Patients come complain early. It looks like if you, if you don't examine properly, it looks like a very immature cataract. It can be, but it can be also harder nuclei. But the main issue here that you should differentiate between the posterior subcapsular cataract, which is actually benign, and the posterior polar cataract. And, and you can see on the right-hand side that this is very typical of posterior polar cataract. You have a regular edge of the posterior capsular opacity. And the thing about this, that inherently this patient would have weak posterior capsule or in some rarer, more rare cases, absent posterior capsule in a, a congenital defect in that area. So what does this mean to you? You have to identify these cases preoperatively because if you, when, once you go into surgery and you identify and see this, then you will abstain from doing hydrosection. Don't do hydrosection, do hydrodelineation. The idea is that you identify, it's a cataract case, yes, but you identify there is a risk. So you modify your technique to avoid the risk, which is here, early posterior capsule rupture, because it's weak. And if you don't identify this, you can get into more serious problems that you don't want, only by identifying the proper type of the cataract. In the case of posterior subcapsular cataract, once you, you see that this is posterior subcapsular, it is not posterior polar, then you will do the whole case as it is. But sometimes in these patients, you will find an adherent fibrosis on the posterior capsule that you will need to do either peeling or posterior capsular excess. So if you go into such cases, doing operating in such cases, be prepared that you or your supervisor has the ability to do posterior capsular access, which is a skill that you should learn over your training period, do learning a fake woman certification. It's very useful, important skill to know how to do posterior capsular access. Moving into another category of cataract or lens problems, the subluxated lenses, and these are completely, you can see, complete different scenarios. And each scenario you have to deal with differently, whether it is senile, whether it's congenital syndrome, whether it's traumatic, whether it is whatever the reason, you will see so many scenarios. And in each scenario, you will see a different type of subluxation, different extent of subluxation and different density of the cataract that you are de dealing with and different situation like the one here on the left, lower left, you can see 
This was traumatic, and you can see vitreous prolapsing in front of the uh, subluxated lens. Even before you start your surgery, so you should plan and be ready in such cases to have the proper tools to have. You should prepare capsular tension rings, capsular hooks, iris hooks, whatever, three-piece intraocular lenses that you might need. So very important that you study the patient before. You are now getting into more complicated cases. So you study the patient, anticipate what you're going to need. You don't need to be surprised inside the operating theater <coughs> asking for a capsule tension ring or a Sayoni ring or an Ahmed segment or a cap capsular hook and you don't find it and you start to panic. If you plan properly, prepare the tools, know the technique and because I told you there are different scenarios, the scenarios you can see the, pay, the, the subluxation preoperatively and you can plan well and you can have intraoperative subluxation either you missed in the diagnosis or you induced the subluxation. So plan well, see the, the condition of the patient and ask to prepare the tools that you expect you are going to need. This makes a lot of difference, even preparing the type of IOL, preparing the type of sutures if you're going to clear fixation, fixate, preparing the micro forceps if you think you will, you will remove the whole bag and you will need a uh, Yamani technique, for example. So it's very important to, to know subluxated lenses is not one type of surgery, not one type of scenario. Plan your surgery, anticipate problems, and be flexible. Pseudo exfoliation, it's something we read in the literature, it's very common in Scandinavia. Actually, we see it very commonly in our region, and you can have it in such pronounced. Uh, appearance like this, you should look for it in older patients. And why we should look for it? Because you can expect narrow pupil, difficult to dilate. You can definitely expect zonulysis. So you have to modify the settings, the height of the, the infusion, the technique uh, that minimizes stress on the zonules. You can expect a hard nucleus. You can expect post-operative or pre-operative open angular glaucoma that you are going to deal with later on. So in such cases, identify what is the, pro, the, what is the diagnosis, anticipate the problems intraoperative and post-operatively and act accordingly. This is a very rare case I presented many times now this case and it's very interesting if you look at this magnified picture you can see all these fine lines actually when i looked there i missed it pre-operatively so when i looked at it at the beginning of the surgery surgery the pupil was perfectly dilated i've never seen or have never noticed some something like this Sometimes you can see aberrant insertion of zonules, but I have never seen such zonules extending to the central three, four millimeters. And when I looked at the literature after the surgery, after I had problems, I learned this is called long anterior zonule syndrome. It is rare, but it's very important to identify. And since I had this case, I always look carefully and preoperatively at the beginning of surgery to, to see the presence of long anterior zonules. It can be complete like this case, or it can be partial like more common cases. And why I was interested to know, because at the beginning of this surgery, I thought that my whole problem will be doing a capsular axis without extension of the capsular axis by the help of this long zonules, but actually I managed to do a perfect small capsular excess, but continuous. And I, I thought, okay, everything is, is done. But actually, and I think we, we will give an example. I will show this case in a later ep episode. Actually, what, what, after I finished and I started fake classification, everything went wrong because as you can see, when I did the excess, I didn't do it big, but I, I cut the insertion of the zonules. So actually the bag became completely loose. So during the fake classification, I found the bag was completely coming out. So I had to remove it, implant in that case, 
uh, an iris glow lens, posterior fixated. But the problem was also that I I knew I got this patient got into intractable glaucoma postoperative. And when I looked at the literature, these patients specifically they have a high incidence of preoperative or postoperative open angle glaucoma, sometimes due to shedding of the um, this material of the zinus, like pseudo exfoliation, blocking the, the angle. So Doctor, this is very have, important. Uh, you have, uh, because Dr. Brian, he want to, he has having only a short time to be with us. Yeah, and I want I, just to comment, to have a comment before you can, if you continue. Uh, so, Brian, I know you are going to leave us because you have another commitment and your patient in the clinic. So, please, if you have something to say, whatever the Dr. Yaha is mentioned till now, any comment, then we will continue with Dr. Yaha and other friends comment. Uh, Dr. Yahya, um, I think he, you've done a marvelous job condensing the entire universe of cataracts and cataract surgery in this lecture. So, I think uh, I don't have much to add. But for the residents, I would reiterate the car analogy about driving. Not only are you using both feet, but you're using both hands. So when you're doing cataract surgery, don't neglect your secondary hand. You have to become facile, being uh, comfortable doing intraocular maneuvers with both hands. So when you're learning cataract surgery, bear that in mind. Uh, number two, just remember, as Dr. Yahya said, Every case is different. And, uh, you know, one, some cases are easy, some cases are not. And so bear in mind that every case is a step-by-step -step learning process. And uh, number three, uh, as Dr. Yehi also said, recognize the potential pitfalls and challenges before you get into the situation. So prepare, um, plan accordingly, and uh, study before you do the procedure. And of course, it's helpful to have mentors by your shoulder when you're doing new types of cases, different types of cases. Start off with a one to two plus lens. And then after that, you know, graduate to the next level. You know, I'm, a, <clears throat> I'm Korean, American, and uh, I did Taekwondo, you know, martial arts. So, you know, you start off with the white belt, but then you graduate to the yellow belt and so forth. So it's the same principle. You can't be black belt in one day and learn from all your mentors, and one day you will become a black belt. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Brian. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for being with us. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I'm, all, yeah. I'm almost, almost finished. So we move to traumatic cataracts, and here you should ask yourself, is it an open globe or, or closed globe? Is it blood trauma or a perforating or a penetrating trauma? Is the anterior capsule open? Is the posterior capsule open or both are open? Is there is cortical material in the anterior chamber? If there is intraocular foreign body? So it's so many questions and you, you will know by time that the traumatic cataracts again present in different ways and you have to have a strategy, particularly timing of surgery. Would it, you do it with closure of the wound the uh, penetration, or you better wait uh, for healing, avoiding infection, better uh, IOL calculation. Would you, if the, uh, the, the cortex is in the anterior chip, would you implant primary with repair of the uh, lacerated cornea or not? And always remember any trauma cases, any open globe injury has a risk of intraocular infection, which is very serious that you should prevent and look for uh, to avoid. Another entity is uveitic cataracts. These are difficult cases. A lot of sanitia, you can have shallow anterior chamber, you can have very uh, tight pupil sanitia in the edge of the pupil or extending to the back of the, the pupil. More important than dealing with the cataract, understanding and having a diagnosis of which type of uveitis, because then you can decide timing of surgery according to covering with steroids and the, there is no activity of the uveitis. There are so many intraoperative challenges to deal with the Sanikia, shallow AC, which type of IOL you are going to implant, if any, to be compatible, biocompatible and uh, uh, uveal compatibility is very important. 
you might need in many cases like Bechet syndrome or cases with posterior uveitis or pars planitis. You may need to do a pars plana vitrectomy. You might deal with glaucoma, preoperative or uh, post-operative, uh, many post-operative co co uh, considerations. One of the most important thing is the length you're going to use steroids post-operative, which is usually different than the regular regime you're going to use in regular cataract cases. So uveitic cataracts is another challenge and we're going to see. And lastly, but not least, the congenital or the developmental cataracts, though they are very soft, but the main challenge here is number one, Preoperative biometric issue is related to the age and the growth of the eye, the type of IOL, where you are going to implant the IOL. And intraoperatively, the main challenge is doing a properly sized capsulorexis that you control and the technique it changes in children because the, the capsule is very elastic and usually it gets larger than you intend. And this is something that you don't want. And the, sec the sec second important thing that we know because in children and, uh, and infants as well, the posterior capsule is 100% going to be opacified due to high healing power. Then you should learn and definitely in all cases of the childhood cataract, you should do primary posterior capsular access wide enough so as not to be occluded. And if in younger patients below three, four years, you should also add anterior vitrectomy to decrease the post-operative inflammatory reaction. So these are particular cases and actually it needs more experience to do than regular cases. So finally, in conclusion, what I know I want to uh, convey here for younger colleagues, it is not just a cataract. More important, what type of a cataract? Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Yahya. Really a very interesting and excellent presentation. You tell me we don't know what to say, but you say a lot, a lot. I mean, you talk about everything. Just we need only to clarify and maybe we have to dig deep to each point that you mentioned. Uh, inshallah, in the uh, coming episodes of Qatar. Uh, so now I think if there is any comment, Dr. Zena, Dr. Safwan, Dr. Sharif, about uh, the talks of Dr. Yahya, then we can proceed with Dr. Sharif. Well, I think you Dr. Yahya covered you are all mute, yeah. so, the, the types of cataract. And uh, once we go further into this, uh, uh, epi these different episodes, we'll see more uh, details on what Dr. Yahya showed us. And I hope everybody enjoys uh, these cataract episodes, uh, inshallah. Thank you, Dr. Safwan. <laughs> Comprehensive uh, and, uh, uh, and, and a very classic, class, uh, and very uh, uh, and a highly classified way. And as Dr. Sharif said, that we, we need to go through it. Uh, in detail, inshallah, but uh, it was presented in a very nice way, in a very excellent way. So uh, I think that um, uh, we can proceed and go to- Dr. Zena, if you have any comments, please. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, I have a lot of comments on the separate topics, but, um, but I think it makes more sense to wait till each one is uh, specifically presented. You know, the one summary point I would say is preparation um, is, is vital. Um, and also now we have a lot of um, imaging technologies that can help us in um, kind of being more prepared, um, you know, especially for the younger surgeons, you know, knowing how much zonular loss there is, you know, not just doing a clinical exam, uh, looking at the space between the lens and the iris or looking for actual movement, but even looking at biometry, you know, if, if a lens isn't that dense, but the anterior chamber is very shallow, less than two, that, that could kind of let you think that maybe the location of the lens <coughs> is in the right position. Also, um, sometimes I like using my catalyst laser for uh, the uh, post potential PSCs versus posterior polar cataracts, because you can actually see the imaging of, uh, you know, if that there is a break in the posterior capsule, so you're a little bit more prepared. Um, and then, uh, you know, decompression for the, the white cataracts, the needle decompression has really changed my management of, uh, of doing those uh, surgeries. So thanks so um, much. The, the talk was phenomenal and um, so many great pearls. 
thank you very much for all. I think now we need to proceed with uh, my dear friends, uh, Dr. Sharif. Uh, Dr. Sharif, he will talk about logistic of starting, and then he will talk about FACO machine fluidics. Uh, Dr. Sharif, the mic with you, please. <coughs> Okay, Dr. Sharif. Hello, Dr. Yahya, Dr. Mohammed. Can you see the screen? Yeah, okay, please, yeah. Okay. So my talk is uh, on how to uh, uh, commence and proceed with uh, FACO emulsification. Of course, uh, we all know for beginners, it is important uh, to know uh, the FACO dynamics and uh, what machine you are dealing with because there are different and lots of types of machines. There are uh, classic machines and there are advanced machines. And uh, every uh, resident who is going to start working with his FACO emulsification uh, needs to know exactly how this uh, machine is, is working and uh, what's the difference between each type of machine if he's going to work on different machines. I prefer that he sticks to a certain machine until he improves his technique and uh, goes through uh, in different cases and then he can uh, later on choose to change uh, the machine because each machine has uh, several advantages over other machines and some disadvantages as well. So it's important uh, to know uh, your machine quite well before you start your cataract surgery. And nowadays I see uh, it's like uh, driving a new car and you have to read the manual very good in order uh, to uh, drive safely and drive properly. And then later on you can go faster and maneuver yourself with your car as you learn uh, different uh, uh, using different uh, settings uh, inside your car. It's the same with a FACO machine. You have to work on your uh, foot pedal uh, and know what this foot pedal correlates exactly with the machine and how you change from step one to step two to step three and what changes occur in the, in, in the machine, the panel and uh, uh, the setups inside the panel. Uh, which setup are you going to start working uh, on? And if you are going to change the setup uh, during your surgeries, uh, how are you going to do that? And what will this uh, be effective in your surgery? And if you don't do this, you will end up, of course, uh, crashing. Uh, and this is why you wonder why, why am I, uh, what went wrong with my surgery? Uh, uh, in the end. So, uh, FACO dynamics, what is FACO dynamics? By definition, it's the various functions of the machine and their interrelationships. The FACO machines have two main functions. The ultrasound, it delivers the ultrasound power as well as it controls uh, your fluidics inside the eye. So, what is the power actually? It's the electric current pass passing through a quartz crystal which will generate a, a vibration of a precise frequency exactly like uh, uh, these are the quartz crystals and uh, if you don't know it's used inside the watches in order to uh, regulate the time uh, in an exact matter uh, it's used in the FACO uh, handpiece to generate the ultrasound frequency needed for emulsification the frequency of the ultrasound machine is between 30 and 60 kilohertz in different machines. Uh, high frequency equals better cutting, but more heat generation. In all machines, vibrations are fixed. So in order to modulate the power, it's by changing the stroke length. Power equals oscillations times stroke length and energy equals the power multiplied by the time utilized. Take a tip. FACO tips, there are different types of FACO tips uh, in uh, FACO machines. We have different angles at the FACO tips. There is the 30 degree angles, there is the zero degree angle, there is the 45 degree angles and the 60 degree angles. Nowadays, most surgeons uh, work with the 30 degree angle because 
uh, it can uh, go through all steps of the surgery without needing to change this uh, uh, phaco tip. Uh, in divide and conquer, uh, if you are doing the groove, for example, you can go with a 45 degree angle. It's easier, it doesn't get blocked so easily. So it is, it's easier to do the groove with a 45 degree angle. But as I said, that working with 30 degree angle can do the job as well. Uh, however, while using uh, going through with a stop and chop, use a 30 degree angle. Of course, uh, bent tip now are used widely because with the introduction of uh, torsional uh, FACO, uh, these tips are bent. So uh, bent tips are used, uh, as we see in the image down, in order to uh, improve our FACO, uh, FACO emulsification techniques by using the torsional uh, technology. What about power and delivery? There are two types of uh, power delivery. There is the linear in which pa power varies from zero to maximum according to the degree, degree of depression in the foot pedal in position three. Uh, you can fix the power uh, if you want, but most surgeons prefer the linear uh, rise in the power, which is controlled by the foot pedal. But if you want to change, uh, to start with a fixed power, and continue with the fixed power, you can do this uh, also. And you reach this maximum power once you, re you step into uh, step three in you with your FACO uh, emulsification foot pad. What about the delivery? You can uh, do a continuous uh, power delivery or you can use the uh, FACO pulsed mode. And there is also the burst mode. Uh, in pulse mode, the, uh, there is variable on, on and off intervals in the delivery of the FACO power. Uh, variation of the panel uh, uh, includes burst mode also, where depression in the pedal in the position three results in variation in time, uh, in interval time. Both pulse and burst are aimed to decrease FACO time and hence the FACO energy uh, as well. We move now to the fluidics, which is a very important uh, step, if not the most important step. The fluidics are the integrated system of irrigation aspiration in order, uh, sorry, in order to maintain the stability and the volume of the anterior chain. In irrigation, it is the inflow of the BSS into the eye, governed by the pressure gradient between bottle height and negative pressure created by the aspiration port. In advanced FACO machines, these machines have sensors at the FACO tip that allow active control of the intraocular lens uh, by elevating the height of the machine. The intraocular pressure inside the eye is roughly 75% of the bottle height. If you have a too high bottle, it results in a high intraocular pressure, which might lead to iris prolapse and uh, this might injure the iris and result in further uh, complications during the surgery as meiosis, a result of trauma to the iris. A too low bottle height results in unstable anterior chamber, which may result in injuring the cornea, iris capture by the phaco tip, and uh, also meiosis due to the hypothesis. It's preferable to have a higher uh, intraocular pressure or a higher bottle height than a lower bottle height unless you have complications which we will discuss uh, further, then you need to lower the, your uh, bottle height. What about aspiration? Aspiration, we have two modes in, uh, uh, in which the aspiration works. First, the flow rate, and second is the vacuum. And you use each one of these two uh, in a different way while performing your FICO uh, uh, emulsification. Con consider yourself uh, uh, drinking a drink and you are using while drinking this drink a straw. If you are sucking the, 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 the juice with the straw, this is you are creating the flow. As long as the fluid or the juice is moving inside your mouth, this is the flow. It is what comes from inside the anterior chamber into the FACO machines. It's the amount of fluid removed together with the emulsified lens matter through the aspiration tip. Once this aspiration tip gets occluded, then vacuum will start to build up and you are changing into another mode. Uh, and this vacuum you need it in order to grasp 
your uh, FECO uh, fragmented uh, lens matter and you, in, in order to uh, induce uh, your uh, divide, division of the nucleus or doing the chop, you need to have a very whole grasp of this uh, nucleus fragment in order to do the chopping. And this is utilized by the vehicle. So with flow rate, you are removing emulsified lens material from the anterior chamber and outside of the eye. While in vacuum, you are holding this lens either whole or part in order to do your dissection. It's like eating a piece of meat. You are using a fork and a knife. With the uh, uh, fork, your fork is your vacuum. And this holds the lens fragment tightly in order to be able to divide this lens matter and once you grasp this uh, divided lens fragment, you start your emulsification by utilizing the power and then uh, emulsifying it and then removing it by using the flow rate after it emulsifies and it goes out of the eye. There are two types of pumps that are used uh, with uh, fake emulsification. We have the peristaltic pump and we have uh, the Venturi pump. And both pumps work uh, uh, differently. In peristaltic pump, it consists of a roller compressing the silicon tube. These roller will turn in a clockwise uh, fashion or an anti-clockwise fashion. It doesn't make a difference. But during this ro uh, rolling uh, of these uh, uh, systems, they compress the silicon tube of the aspiration system. And this movement allows aspiration uh, from inside the anterior chamber through the tubes and outside into the collecting uh, system. Uh, peristaltic uh, is a more controlled and it's slower than Venturi and it's advisable for beginning residents to use peristaltic pumps as Venturi pumps are much more faster and less controllable. So I believe that experienced surgeons should work with Venturi. However, uh, beginners and even those who like peristaltic pumps and like to have more control during the surgery should use uh, peristaltic pumps. Venturi pumps as, uh, act as a result of moving a gas into the tube. This movement creates a negative pressure of the flow rate and the relationship of the vacuum created to the flow rate is not linear. The flow rate is normally between 20 and 35 cc's per minute. A low flow rate means better control. However, you have a longer surgery. A high flow rate means a faster surgery, less control, and you are more liable to induce complications if you are not an expert or an advanced surgeon. If you work with high flow rate and high vacuum, you are more, more likely to uh, uh, cause complications, so it's better. If you are beginning your surgery to start with a low flow rate, something like 20, 25, a maximum of 30 to 35, and a vacuum of uh, 250 to 300. If you are an advanced surgeon, you might need to, uh, 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 if you like, of course, to work with higher flow rate, reaching up to 50 uh, cc's per minute, and a vacuum of up to 500 or maybe more if you need to perform your surgery in a faster uh, uh, mode. Uh, modulation of the flow depends on the surgeon's expertise and uh, preferences. Vacuum will only rise after uh, occlusion. I'm sorry for the spelling mistake. Occlusion will start. Uh, vacuum is the holding power of the lens fragment in order to, in order to start the emulsification and aspiration uh, process. Uh, the PFECO port size will affect the vacuum. Uh, the smaller the size, uh, the higher the vacuum. Lastly, we are going to talk about the surge. It occurs during emulsification of uh, a lens fragment. As the vacuum builds up and the fragment is held tight at the tip, once this fragment is emulsified, the negative pressure at the tip will fall instantaneously, resulting in collapse of the anterior chamber. Of course, in modern machines, this problem has been over, uh, overcome and uh, by different processes, including venting, uh, thick uh, aspiration uh, rigid tubing and delay in motor start after occlusion uh, uh, break. I think this is a, a start in, uh, uh, or uh, uh, just an introduction in order to show us uh, how we have to be sure on how to work on the machine 
and we have to study our machine uh, quite well and to have to know to know exactly which setup and each change in, 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 in each one of these setups will affect our working. Our, what happens actually inside the eye is not only controlled by your hands, but it's controlled by the machine that's working beside you or behind you. So keep in mind to have the screen of the machine in front of your eyes. You have to change the setup yourself uh, uh, when you are starting your FACO emulsification in order to get to know and be user friendly with your machine until you know exactly which setup that you are going to work uh, uh, will uh, allow you to work in a very relaxed uh, mode. And of course, the synchronization between your foot and uh, the foot position, you have to be acquainted quite well uh, while you are going with your foot uh, through position one in which once you step to, uh, into position one, you will start your irrigation. Step two will start your aspiration. And once you reach step three, FACO emulsification, and all of the previous step will be already working with you. So you have to be uh, uh, quite acquainted and quite comfortable with both your hands inside the eye. Part of your mind is with the machine that's outside and delivering whatever uh, needed uh, parameters that uh, control what's going on inside the eye. And finally, the foot switch, which is the violin that's uh, tuning your uh, 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 work inside the eye while going through different uh, positions, uh, allowing uh, different effects to occur inside uh, the anti chamber. And in uh, the future uh, sessions, we will discuss in details how we are working with different uh, machine setups in order to work through uh, different types of cataract, uh, like Dr. Yahya showed us, of course. And I hope all of you who are watching will uh, continue watching with us as we are going to present in the future uh, very nice and very attractive presentations in order uh, for the uh, young ophthalmologists and those who are venturing through FACO emulsification will get to know uh, more uh, about how uh, you uh, can move through different techniques in order to successfully perform uh, the different uh, situations that you are going to encounter during your FACO emulsifications. And uh, thank you uh, very much. And I hope to meet you all soon in, uh, with Dr. Mohammed, of course, in uh, future uh, meetings uh, next year, inshallah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Yahya. Uh, sorry, Dr. Sharif. So you are both mixing my head today. Uh, Dr. Sharif, thank you a lot for this very, very nice and comprehensive uh, and excellent presentation. And it shows step by step how can we deal with uh, machines and what are the things that we should be put in our minds when we are starting doing. And I think uh, my comment, if there is, if it's, you allow me, this is not only for the beginners. We need all this information to remind ourselves. Even the complication can happen with those they are very expert. So because sometimes we are trying to do something as fast as we much, then we go and have uh, complications. So I think it is very uh, beneficial for everyone, not only for the beginners, to remember all this step that you mentioned. And I think we can have more details about all this information you mentioned in our uh, in upcoming uh, episodes of uh, cataract in upcoming webinars. Uh, just if there is any question from any panelist here uh, to Dr. Sharif or from uh, Dr. Sharif to another panelist. Uh, we would like to start with Dr. Zaina. If you allow me our guest from here, then Dr. Zaina, if you have any comment about this one. Yeah, no, I thought it was a great uh, introductory uh, uh, presentation. I think for residents and people starting out um, in surgery, it's so important to learn phaco dynamics. A lot of the time you just, when you're being staffed by someone else, um, you just kind of don't even ask these questions because you're so worried about the cataract itself. <laughs> um, I always make sure that my residents have uh, understand what phaco dynamics are. And I think the key is that every single machine is very different. So. Um, for example, in one of my centers, we have the Centurion, the Alcon Centurion. So it's peristaltic. So everything that most people are used to peristaltic and a lot of the data, a lot of the 
uh, discussion is usually that. My other, um, you know, surgery center, we have the Stellaris um, and the Stellaris uses Venturi settings. And then also, you know, we talk about pressing down on the pedal, for example, the Stellaris, you know, not just as Venturi, but you can actually separate uh, FACO power from um, vacuum settings. So you can have a different vacuum when you're pressing down and then kick to the right, yaw to the right with this. So you're adding a whole, ex you know, different dimension um, which I think is really nice for some of these complex cases. Um, the other thing is I wanted to kind of say, you know, people always ask, so which, you know, you use all of these, which is better. Um, I think all of the new FACO uh, machines now are phenomenal. And it's all about comfort and understanding your machine. And I think the concept of surge is, it's really less likely now. You know, the surge was such a huge issue in the past. Now we have better tubing, we have smaller openings. Um, and I think it's much less of an issue. Um, and then the only other thing I wanted to kind of um, just express is, you know, the concept of, you know, peristaltic pumps, um, you know, mentioned that you have to have full occlusion to get vacuum. And that's not the case for Venturi. Um, and I'm sure we'll talk about it a little bit more, but you can actually get vacuum with Venturi even without full occlusion. So another major difference kind of between the machines. Um, and then, sorry, the third thing that's new or the two other aspects that are new and nice is this concept of active fluidics where you don't have to rely on the bottle height as much and that you have these sensors, which again helps with the concept of surge. And then the nice thing is the new anterior vitrectomy uh, ports can fit through you know, 25 gauge now and go through nice paracentesis for bimanual um, uh, vitrectomy. And that's just been so huge um, in terms of a benefit for our residents. So those are kind of the big picture sort of comments that I would have. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Zena. Dr. Safwan. Well, I, I just need to add to, to Dr. Zena related to the active fluidics. Uh, uh, I think Dr. Ash, uh, uh, Sharif, he mentioned a lot of it. Uh, uh, the sensors present and the bottle height, well, it makes uh, the whole life, all, all the surgeons, whether the beginners or the experts uh, different because we know that the, the important effect on the of the height bottle and the high pressure intraocularly on not only on the iris damaged and the, the zonules but on the on the disc and when we compare now what we are doing on uh, on a pressure of 30 millimeter mercury and the uh, bottle height of 90 uh, we can uh, realize the difference between both and now with the with a, a century uh, tip, I think that we, we reach to a 20 millimeter mercury. A anyway, that's need more de details uh, in, in, uh, in discussion. But uh, uh, related to the, uh, uh, again, one of, one of the points that uh, Sharif, he highlighted the, the foot pedal. I think that one of the important issues to understand for the beginners is the, the, the steps because most of the uh, uh, beginners, they don't know that that the, as Dr. Sharif mentioned it clearly, that the uh, uh, irrigation and aspiration and the uh, power, when we, when we start the third uh, step is the uh, issues for uh, uh, changing and modifying uh, our step uh, because irrigation, aspiration and the third step, for example, in CHOP, what I'm doing is that I'm starting with the high pressure, with the high power and then uh, 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 reaching to the zero at the end of this uh, step three. And this is totally different in reverse to the chop of the usual uh, uh, foot pedal that we are we were using. And I found that this is step by, by changing the power, making it start with the high and then at the end of the pressing, it, you will have a zero power uh, because the power that I need is in the beginning when I hold in and holding the, the nucleus, then I don't need power because if I will increase the uh, and, and, uh, continuing pressing on the third step, then I will end up with uh, rupturing the posterior capsule or I need to return back. If I need more, more power, I need to return back up. So this step is very important to understand. And uh, 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 for, for any beginners anyway, and, and even for the surgeons, to change if according to his uh, uh, a way of dealing with the foot pedal. For me, for example, I don't need to press to have the end of the uh, third, third step 
high power. No, I need the high power in the beginning, especially in CHOP. And I found it uh, very helpful. And uh, if Dr. Sharif have it, he can, uh, he can use it, he can try it, or anyone, he can try it. It's very helpful uh, uh, keeping the power in the third step for CHOP in the highest uh, point and then ending to the zero. Uh, uh, apart from that, it was a very comprehensive uh, 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 lecture. Uh, dealing with the all details related to the, um, uh, the, the, the FICO dynamics and the point that Zaina uh, uh, highlighted in, as a difference between uh, uh, Venturi and Peristaltic is that the holdability, which is the, the vacuum, and, uh, and the followability, that the difference, especially in, 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 in Venturi, you don't need to uh, touch the nucleus to have an, um, a, a holdability, that the vacuum. But in, in, in peristaltic, no, you need, we need to, to, pe to, to make the piece holding uh, and touching the tip in a way that the holdability will start it or the vacuum will start it. Thank okay. you very much, Dr. Okay. Safwan. Uh, I think this, all this, uh, what uh, you elaborate, Dr. Safwan and Dr. Zena, I think we are going to, to talk about in details uh, in futures. Okay. So uh, just now we are just highlighting and we have only an introduction just to keep everybody tuned with us and uh, to wait for us for the more and more details. We don't want to, to give everything in once. So they can just now like a course that we want to say, so everyone is learning. And I do, re I just repeat what I have said. This one, it's not only for the residents, but it can be for all ophthalmologists. Uh, and in the high level, we are going to talk about complication, how to avoid and so many things. So it will be a very interesting for all level of a surgeon or ophthalmologist from the resident till those they are very expert. Uh, is there any any last comment from Dr. Yahya or Dr. Sharif? Then we can uh, just uh, conclude. Thank you, Dr. Mohammed. I think this is a good start يعني, to put people uh, يعني, to know what's important, but uh, I don't need to stress more what Dr. Sharif was saying. And I always tell Everybody who is starting, just you can do, you learn the machine more in wet lab or even in the operating theater without the patient. Yeah, you start the patient. Your first case after you master the sound using both hands, both uh, foot, feet, uh, knowing how each stage is going. So this is very important. Facilitate it removes a lot of the burden on the beginner surgeon when he starts his first cases. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Yahya. There is a small question also before we leave. We don't want to leave any questions. So uh, how can I know the suitable height of bottle for each eye? Uh, I think maybe we will talk about this in detail future, but if there is any very a short comment from Dr. Sharif. <coughs> well, actually uh, in modern machines, uh, the flowability inside the anterior chamber, the anterior chamber is uh, more or less automatically maintained, but you can start with a bottle height of 60 to 90. And if you, while you are working, uh, you find that the anterior chamber is collapsing or that there is not much inflation of the anterior chamber, you can increase your bottle height more uh, if you need so. This comes with the experience while you are working in order to maintain a balance between the inflow and the outflow outside the eye uh, as well. What I want to emphasize here um, about this uh, introduction, uh, and this is a very important takeaway message for the junior staff, uh, don't rush into cataract surgery. I know that everybody wants to perform cataract and successfully uh, be the, uh, do his first cataract. Uh, take your time ac getting acquainted because actually what's go going on inside the eye is controlled by different uh, 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 different instruments outside the eye. Actually, it's the console and it's the foot switch. So uh, know quite well how these uh, uh, different pieces of machines work together in order to, 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 to succeed in performing the surgery uh, finally. Uh, take your time and uh, do not uh, uh, be sad that you are a little bit late in learning the cataract because as much as it is important to perform the cataract, it's more important to know how each machine is uh, doing its job and to uh, get acquainted with this machine very good. 
you. thank you very much for all. It was very interesting, and I would like to thank every one of you for this uh, a nice uh, meeting with a nice comment, with nice presentation. Uh, and I would like to announce that we are going to have a meetings on Friday. It will be on 2nd of uh, April. It's not an anterior, it will be a posterior, another format. So uh, I would like to invite everyone to be with us we, and we will send the invitation soon to everyone. Uh, thank you for all. Thank you, Dr. Azena, Dr. Safwan, Dr. Yahya, Dr. Sharif, Dr. Brian. And also I'd like to thank Alerjan for sponsoring this meeting. And thanks for our uh, uh, management event with us, uh, Marbijan, as usual. And good night for everyone. And good morning for you, Dr. Olga, the afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.